Well, it's eight o'clock in London on Wednesday, the 8th of September. And it's the year 2021. And I welcome you to Golden Nugget Nation this evening. I just wanted to, you know, I just want to take a moment because I think every endeavor needs to start with a sense of gratitude. And hopefully, every endeavor ends with hope. And I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about all of this because, you know, last week we had a wonderful time with Andrea Brannigan. She was here, she just, I mean, uh, she had such a wonderful story that she shared. We could see every component in the law of attraction taking place. And we saw how literally she manifested a car into her life exactly as she wanted it to be there. Now, I think a lot of people think about manifestation of objects. It's like, well, it's just going to appear. Yeah, they do. But at the same time, we have to give value for whatever it is. And as Andrea clearly pointed out, you know, she had figured out how to give value for what she was going to receive. She ended up getting more value than what she had anticipated in her planning. And she gave exactly the value that she was willing to give for what she received. Beautiful story. But what about those times when we're in life and we kind of think, am I going down the wrong path? You know, nothing seems to be happening. And Sometimes I think we kind of get stuck on that whole process. You know, I, it's interesting. I'm changing what I was going to talk about today as I'm speaking. So I, I somehow think maybe this is inspired. Maybe it's not. Somebody listening to this is going to get a message that they needed to hear and not the net message that I was preparing. John Voigt is an American actor who I first became aware of when I was a young teenager. John Voigt uh, won an Academy Award for a role in a movie called Midnight Cowboy. And that was about all that I really knew about him until years later when I found out that his daughter was um, was Angelie Jolie. It's his is his daughter. So there's kind of an acting tradition, acting empire there. But John Voigt recently was speaking with a journalist, news caster by the name of Tucker Carlson in America. And Tucker has a show now where he does a long format interview. And John Voigt came to speak to him because one of the things that he wanted to talk about was the fact that John Voigt is very conservative in his politics in a environment, Hollywood, that seems to disenfranchise and cancel out people who are conservative. And he was asking John Voigt about, you know, what was it like to get the role of Midnight Cowboy? Now, John Voigt was pretty much an unknown before this time period. He had done a couple of bit pieces. He had been on Broadway and more often on off-Broadway doing plays. <clears throat> and when he was doing one of these Broadway plays, he was given the book about Midnight Cowboy. And the person said, you know, you should really look at the part of the cowboy because I really think that would be you. And so he started, and he started realizing that there were a lot of similarities that he could really relate to this guy. And one of the things that he could relate to was that the guy was totally out of his element, which is what he felt being an actor in many ways, totally out of his element. But the other aspect 
that he could relate to is this guy had a real heart of gold. He had a lot of compassion for people. And John Voight felt that he had those qualities as well within himself. And on the day uh, that I want to talk about with John Voight, John was talking about, it was a rainy Sunday. He went to a local market to buy some food. And when he came out, he saw the local drunk. Everybody knew the guy by name. They knew that he didn't really have a very good life. And John Boyd, first thought was, he looks awful. He needs food. Um, and of course, Voigt is a struggling actor on his own. And he just talks to the guy for a minute and says, why don't you come with me? I'll take you home and I'll give you something to eat. So John Voigt takes him into his house, gives him some uh, couple sandwiches that he makes and tells him, you know, you just go ahead and eat that. And he continued having a conversation with him. No judgment, no passing anything about anything. And they had a conversation where he found out that the guy just, you know, lost the love of his life, lost his job, um, started drinking too much, found that there were people who were there for him. Uh, and he would kind of like wander from location to location from time to time. But right now he was kind of like nobody was available when John Boyd found him. But somebody would be available in a couple hours and he could go over to their house. John received a phone call during this conversation with the guy. And it was the producer of the movie, uh, Midnight Cowboy. And they said, you know, John, we're down to two or three guys for the role, uh, you keep surfacing up to the top. I just wanted to make sure you know, you're know you willing to make the commitment to stick with the whole film, to go through the whole process, because you know, you've know you never been in, in any kind of starring role before. You're kind of an unknown. We're not really sure about you. And John Foyt is talking to these people and they actually started like, do you think you can have the heart, the compassion of this guy? And John Voigt said, well, sure, I'm absolutely certain I can. And the end of the call was, John, are, is it possible for you to come over here, be here about an hour or so, and we can talk some more? Uh, he said, I just want to see you one, one last time before I make a decision. And so John told this guy, he says, look, he says, it's still raining, it's still miserable. You told me you got a couple hours before somebody came in. He says, if you just close the door behind you when you leave, and if you want some more food, go ahead and have it. And John Voigt took off, got a cab, went to this producer's um, house, had a meeting with him. And John Voigt got up to leave. And the guy said, wait a minute, John. I want you to do the role. I don't know why, but when I was talking to you on the phone, I just felt like you did have the heart. You did have the compassion for the role. And John Voigt said, I thought about that many, many times because that movie changed my life. I got an Academy Award for the role. He says, I was a young actor. He said, it was my first really major movie. He says, I was only 28 years of age and I won an Academy Award uh, for that role. And he says, of course, I couldn't have done it without Dustin Hoffman. He said, playing against Dustin Hoffman may be even a better actor than what I was. And he said, but I thought about why did that phone call when I was taking care of the drunk man send such a vibration through the phone lines that I had the heart, that I had the compassion that this role would take. And he says, because I was practicing compassion for this man at that exact moment. He says, I think it vibrated through the lines. And in the Golden Nugget Nation, this is something we have to keep in mind we have to be vibrating at the level of what it is we want to attract. And it has to be in all aspects of our life. John Voigt did not just say, I'm gonna be compassionate today with this guy. He was compassionate all the time. Now, 
as his life progresses, I mean, he's like everybody else. He made mistakes in his life, uh, made some bad choices, got some bad roles, uh, ended on the out list or the in list, you know, however things work out in, in that industry. Things weren't going very well in his life at one point, and he started really contemplating maybe he should just end his life. And he was talking about how one afternoon, all alone, he asked out loud, is this what it's supposed to be like? Is this what life is all about? And he said he heard a voice with the most beautiful rhythmness to it, as if it was standing right next to him and said, life is supposed to be hard. And you know, we as entrepreneurs oftentimes think, you know, it should be easier than this. We play comparison games. We look at other entrepreneurs. They don't seem to be struggling exactly like we do. Uh, but oftentimes we don't see their struggles. They're so positive. They're at such a high vibration that where they're struggling is perhaps at a higher level than we'll ever understand at this moment in time. But what we can see is we can see their successes. We can see they're, they're moving forward. They're making progress. And we're sitting down and we shouldn't play this comparison game. The only thing that we need to compare ourselves with is the person we were yesterday. Am I a better version of that person today? Am I doing more of what my why is telling me I need to do so that I can move towards that goal, that dream? I want to tell you about a person I know personally. Donald. Donald um, had failed in business two or three times. His backup plan was to be a military officer. He was a pilot. And so he exited the military a couple of times and tried to go into business and failed. And rarely do they take officers back after one time out. He was out twice. And so they brought him back in with the understanding that he would never achieve a very high rank. He would just be a lieutenant colonel maximum for the rest of his career, no matter how brilliant he was. He was a very smart man. And when he started getting towards the end of his time in service, knowing that he would never see anything higher, having been a Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, I mean, he had, he had, when he was a, a major, they had skipped his promotion two or three times. And if he was skipped one more time, he would be put out at that level. And he wouldn't have gotten the 20 year retirement. And he was really quite nervous about that. <clears throat> but the story is, is that some very high ranking officer wrote to the promotion board and talked about, yes, the guy has exited the service twice. And I've had the opportunity to be a commanding officer to this guy. And he is perhaps the finest officer I've ever worked with. He puts in diligent duties and he actually made my life easier as a commander because he was willing to come in and take on more responsibilities. And he's the kind of man that I'd be glad to endorse. So he ended up becoming a lieutenant colonel. He ended up having this 20 years. And as I say, towards the end of the 20 years, he had a large family and he realized that the retirement income that he was going to receive was never going to be enough for his family. So he started looking for opportunities, possibilities. He, he was on his days off, he was substitute teaching at a local high school. It made some money, but it wasn't anything that satisfied him. And he felt like an over glorified babysitter with children who knew that they could misbehave today because 
in the end, he's just a substitute teacher. They didn't really want to learn from him. Then he came, he realized he came from a family of builders. He had learned from his father how to be a carpenter. And so he found some building crews that were building, you know, custom houses, got involved with that. And he enjoyed getting back into the carpentry and doing that work. But he also realized again, unless he was actually running a company and had his own crews and was making the bids, et cetera, things that he didn't really have interest in, he was never going to make the kind of money or have the lifestyle that he wanted to achieve. He had a base. He just wasn't going to be that far above it. And he was getting older and in 10 years time, would he just be wore out from all of this hard labor that carpentry was all about? And one day he wanted to go buy a used car for his children. And he walked in to car lots, started looking at cars and it was very, very hot where he was living. And Don noticed that every used car seemed to have a cracked dashboard every single one of them. And he finally asked about this. Oh yeah, the sun is so hot here. When people leave their windows closed, sometimes inside the car can get up to almost 175 degrees. So you're talking, you know, like 70 degrees inside uh, Celsius. And the uh, dashboards uh, expand and the crack uh, because metal, doesn't give way and so they they bend up or they bend down or whatever they're going to do when they expand and it cracks and it cracks the um, the vinyl that they put on it leather didn't really crack but nobody puts leather on they all just put vinyl to make it look like it and so he got the idea he says what if you got carpet and put it on and so he started making patterns of these dashboards and he started trying on carpet. He found that some carpet just wasn't the right quality, it would fade. And he noticed that, you know, the carpet at the bottom of a car, you know, that you put your feet on never seems to fade. The carpet that they use when they put it in the back of the um, back window on that little shelf, that never seems to fade. And so he started finding out who manufactured that carpet. He started finding that there were companies that had huge remnants because a model year would end, the color would change slightly, and they would have this carpet that was of no use to anybody now in the manufacturing industry. And he found that he could buy it rather cheaply. And so he started making replacement dashboard mats. It's just him and him and his son-in-law on his days off would come in and help him out. And they made patterns for over 7,000 different kinds of cars, you know, every model, make, upgrade, etc. And as he started putting out more of these dashboard covers, he would invest the money back into whatever he was doing and would buy more of the remnant carpet, etc. And in about three years time, he had about 30 people working for him. And he had three salesmen that were taking different parts of the country. And he had dealerships and independent buyers and auto parts suppliers that were selling his, his product. And everybody was very happy and the company started to grow. But he never made enough money that he could actually pay himself. He was paying everybody else. You know, he was, and um, when extra money existed, it was just an investment in the company. He was living off of his military pension. Seven years in, he ended up with an opportunity on a, some kind of a discount voucher to take his wife for their 30th wedding anniversary on a cruise. And so he uh, 
was able to get on a cruise for like 20% of the actual cost. <clears throat> it was a four day cruise. They drove, he couldn't even afford to fly out to where the meet the ship. They just went to LA, I think, in the car, drove overnight, parked it someplace, took a bus in to get to the bus, to the cruise ship, got on the cruise ship, went south to Mexico, and then back, just a four day cruise. That was the only holiday in seven years that he actually took with his wife. He always sent his children on holiday with the wife. He had bought a, a large van so that they could go places, see things. And oftentimes he would mention to me, you know, Gary, I just really wish I could go on the holidays I provide for my family. 10 years into this, and suddenly somebody went to sue him. They were claiming that uh, he had stolen their, their patented item they had, that he had. I mean, this is letters from a lawyer saying, you know, we have a patent on what you're doing. Uh, we have, uh, 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 we called our product Dash Guard. You called your product Dash Bad. You know, I mean, that kind of thing. That, that, those aren't the real names, but that's, you know, kind of like what, what's going on. Your logo looks very close to our logo, all this kind of, you stole our product, you stole everything. We started six months before you, da, 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 da. Well, you know, lawsuits cost a lot of money. And he had to kind of defend himself and he was thinking, you know, maybe I should quit, maybe I should give up. I've never really made any money out of this. I mean, I'm paying payroll to people. There's a lot of families that are supported by this now. Um, I, I just don't know what to do on this. And he was in this, do I give up mode? Am I going the wrong path? Uh, because he was receiving cease and desist orders from this lawyer to stop what he was doing. And so he sat down and said, you know, I did everything right. We did a registration search across the entire country. We went to every state um, registrar of businesses with our name to see if we were close or, or crossing over somebody else's. We told them what our products were all about. <clears throat> Nobody read, raised a red flag at all. Um, with our registered business. So I think, you know, I'm in the right, but I just don't want to get into a big lawsuit. And this Donald sat down in a quiet place and he was trying to think his way through the problem. Should he fold his business? Because he couldn't make an offer. He didn't have the money to make an offer to try to buy the other guy's rights or to, I mean, it was only really to fold. And in the process of sitting there, he received a phone call from a retired now JAG officer. And that man said, you know, Don, I don't know why, but you came into my mind last night and I can't get you out. I'm calling you up. Is there anything I can do to help you? And so Don told him about what he was going through and the guy says, send them to me. So he sent all the paperwork to this, this gentleman who made a few phone calls, who did a little bit of due diligence that, you know, as a lawyer, he probably knew how to do, but Don had no clue about it came back to Don, he says, it's a scam, Don. They, uh, they're st basically stealing your thing and trying to make it their own. They never registered the company for five years, if it even existed, but you were registered as a company way back then. Uh, they never tried to trademark their thing. In fact, they were counseled out three or four times on the trademark because it nearly cost yours. And so that's why they sent you the cease and desist. He says, we can sue them. What do you want to do? 
and I said, would you please just tell them to cease and desist or I will sue them. Well, they vanished overnight. Long story short at this point, two years later, we're now talking, he's 10 years in business, uh, 10 years, he's 12 years in business. All of a sudden, overnight, he's a multimillionaire. He's, he's got 400 people working for him. He's got a factory of 40,000 square feet producing these things. And now he has a major distributing company coming in and saying to him, we would like to buy your operation. And Don's sitting there thinking, well, what's my company worth? He's looking at the amount of sales that they make, probably making about 15, 20 million a year in sales. He doesn't know what to value. His company doesn't have a clue. And this firm walked over to him and said, 600 million, <laughs> we will buy. We will buy the whole thing and we'll absorb all your debt. Done deal. Uh, when you go through struggles, it's the vibration that you are at that gets you through that struggle. Everything is frequency, vibration, and energy in this universe. And energy cannot be destroyed. It can be changed into matter. But when the matter is removed, the energy is still there. It's, it's returned to that energetic state. I hope you get the impression saying, I want to leave you with this quote. When you're going down a path and you're getting obstacles and there are no solutions, there are no guidances there are no anything and you've asked for help and you're at a wall and you can't get through it you can't get around it you can't get over it you can't get under it maybe that's a signal that you're going the wrong way my child from the universe but when you're going the right way you will have obstacles but you will find there's a way through. Anybody who's read the Harry Potter books knows there's a line in the books where Dumbledore says, when anybody needs help at Hogwarts, it's here to find. They will find it. When you need help and you are doing the right thing, help will present itself. Now, you can be blind to it. You can deny it. You can say, I'm not going to do that. You can say a lot of different things. Those are your choices. But if you're humble, if you're teachable, the way will be shown to you. And when your why is big enough, and you know precisely with great specificity what it is that you want, you will know the path to follow. It's true in Don's story. It's true in Andrea's story last week. It's just true in life. And John Boyd points that out. You know, when he wondered, why is this so hard? Because it's supposed to be hard. You wouldn't appreciate it any other way. Sometimes it's an easy thing. Sometimes the universe just wants you to get started in the right direction. It seems pretty easy. And then also you start getting the hard. And that's when people quit because they go, oh, it's just too hard. Life is hard work. Being an entrepreneur is hard work. But the hope is keep your vibration up. Keep that attitude of gratitude. Keep your focus and your vision on the end of what it is that you want and have that massive how, have that massive how. That how that will drive you, that how that makes you cry at night because you don't have it yet. 
just follow the path. You will get there. Every entrepreneur does. And you may be going down the wrong path right now. And if you are, just get on the right one. There are many roads to the top of Mount Fuji. Just get on the one that's meant for you. Thank you very much. Lovely talking to you. Nugget Nation. You are in the right place. This is your time. And for whoever this message was meant for tonight, hear it, live it, become it. Raise your vibration to be who you were always meant to be. Thank you all. Have a great night. See you next week.